you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Acts in the New Testament? We're going to be looking at chapter 18 and beginning to read in verse 12 there. As you're turning there, a um, guy named Courtney Campbell, Eric would remember him, was a good friend of mine, but also an irritant. He was really more than a friend. He was a brother in Christ, but he was irritating, not in the negative sense of the word. The problem was this, Courtney Campbell had a brilliant mathematical mind. He was a math major at Hamden Sydney College. He was a very humble guy from the country in Southwest Virginia. But what irritated me was we called him the curve buster. Uh, we never were able to get a curve on these grades because when the rest of us senior math majors were getting 70s and 80s, he was getting 95s and hundreds, and he could do it like clockwork. He just got it. I, I, I believe he should have become a math professor, and uh, he just had this way about him. Uh, and, you know, as I think about it, uh, in the Sunday school lesson just a few weeks ago, uh, we looked at a synagogue ruler, and he just got it. You may remember uh, Jesus was traveling to heal this centurion, not synagogue leader. I meant to say centurion. This centurion's um, servant. And as he made his way, they stopped, and the centurion said, Jesus, you do not need to go any further. I know that you can just say the word where you are right now. You don't even have to go into my house and my servant will be healed. And it happened just as he said. And Jesus said these words, if I could paraphrase, he said uh, to this Roman centurion, not a Jew, he said, you're a curve buster. In other words, he says, I've not seen in all of Israel anyone who can compare to the faith that you've demonstrated. You know, we're in this study in Paul's second missionary journey today. And it's my desire that you and I get it. That we actually are able to see what God is trying to teach us through these narratives in Paul's second missionary journey. Last week, we looked at a promise that God gave to Paul. He said, I have many people in this city. You continue, you continue in the work and I will take care of you. And so today... We find Paul still in Corinth, still preaching amidst adversity, and God fulfilling that promise. Look with me at Acts chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. There in Corinth, while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship in ways God, uh, worship God in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or of a serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal, but none of these things mattered to Gallio. After staying for some time, Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters and sailed away to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. He shaved his head at Sincrea because of a vow he had taken. When they had reached Ephesus, he left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and debated with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he declined. But he said, farewell, and added, I'll come back to you again if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. Let's pray. Lord, as we look to your word today, we thank you for what we have been able to study in these past months, in these first two missionary journeys of Paul. And Father, Father as we look at these few verses today and summarize, Lord, uh, what we have reviewed, what we have gone over, I pray you would speak to our hearts and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're finishing out the second missionary journey of Paul. If you've been with us, it's been since about October. We 
began our study in the first journey of Paul. And so as we conclude, as you may well know, there were three missionary journeys Paul carried out. We're going to wait and, and cover the third missionary journey after Easter. Next week, I hope you'll be here as we move toward Resurrection Day. Sunday, there'll be a message on the gospel. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for people to respond to the gospel. Two weeks from today, I'll be out of the pulpit. Uh, we're going to help my wife Karen's mom get situated in a retirement facility there in in East Tennessee, but we're going to have a blessing. Sean Ames is going to be our guest speaker. He's our area missionary for our group of Southern Baptist churches in the Central Virginia area. And then we'll have Resurrection Day Sunday. And then I look forward after Resurrection Day Sunday to continuing our study in these journeys as we pick back up in the third journey. But this morning, I want to reflect back at what we looked at last week. Just two words that Jesus spoke, the Lord Jesus spoke to Paul. And they were these two words, I have, I have. You know, we're going to see how these two words are fulfilled in today's text. And then we're going to look back at this study and see how God's sovereign hand was over everything. And hopefully, like a Courtney, hopefully like that centurion, we will actually get it and embrace with faith what God's able to do. And, and, and re really, as we continue from those two words, he said, I have, and he finished by saying, many people in this city. I want to confess to you that as I can often do, I undershot what God meant in that. I, I was thinking that the many people had to do with the Christians that were in uh, this particular city. But as I began to study this week and as I began to look at this man, Gallio, I realized that I did undershoot God, that God didn't just have Christians in that city, but he had other people like Gallio who were paving the way for the Lord uh, to do his work through Paul. Gallio was a proconsul there in Achaia. It was a senatorial province. He was given a responsibility over that area of Achaia. He was not always involved in the daily affairs of the people, but were there to be a problem, he would both be the one who would be looked to to solve the problem, but also the one who would be held accountable by Caesar to suppress or to to resolve a particular problem. If you could think of the Roman Empire like this, and it's sort of an oversimplification, uh, the teachers would be like the religious leaders or the political leaders in that particular area or among that particular nationality. Then the principal would be like the proconsul. And then uh, the emperor would be like the superintendent. And so many times, just as in a school system, the superintendent may not deal with the day-to-day -day activities within the classroom. There may be time for uh, the superintendent to act. Usually it would go to what? The principal. And the principal would deal with that matter. And thus we see the case here. The Jews were bringing to this man, Gallio, the proconsul, an issue that they had. And the issue we find here in Acts chapter 18 had to do with Paul and the Christians. And they were saying to Gallio, they were complaining. They were saying, here's a man he has come and he's introducing a new religion that is defying, that is breaking the laws. And they were speaking not just of their laws. They were trying to convince uh, Gallio that they were breaking the laws of the Roman Empire. And they thought they had an agreeable ear, but they did not. They were wrong. Because Gallio basically responds in this, you're bringing to me these matters that are really not a crime. Uh, they do not have anything to do with me or with Roman law. They have to do with your own law. And so he pushed them out of the tribunal and said, deal with those matters yourself. And so when the Lord said to Paul last week, I have many people, one of those persons was most certainly Gallio, because he allowed the gospel work to continue. But it wasn't just that he allowed, but God himself was stirring the mind in the heart of Gallio. Do you realize God is over everything? That God controls everything. He is sovereign over every single thing. Do you realize he's sovereign over this fall's election? 
I was talking with a friend yesterday. He is already stressed, and I can agree about what's going to happen this fall. There's so much division. There's so much negativity coming from every way, and it can be concerning. But you know what? God is sovereign. God doesn't lose sleep over it. He doesn't fret. He has people in places. He is sovereign over leaders and over followers. And he desires to be sovereign over your life. Do you realize the God of all creation wants to be Lord of your life and my life? And God can use any person to affect his purpose. What was his purpose in Corinth at that time? It was that Paul stay there an extended time, 18 months, so that he might continue to preach the gospel. Now we saw in the other towns and cities to which he visited during the first and second journey, he didn't stay that long. I don't know why he only stayed someplace, maybe a week or two weeks. Maybe God saw fit that the seed was planted well enough in that period of time and Paul could move on. We looked at time when Paul was threatened and he was moved out of a town or a city But our God's sovereign hand, and the gospel was not stopped. It just led Paul to go to another area where the gospel was continued to be preached. And so as we look at it, we see the sovereign hand of God, but it shouldn't surprise us. We see God's sovereign hand all through the Bible. Think about the Old Testament. There was going to be a famine in Egypt. Joseph's brothers thought they were responsible for sending him into uh, captivity, which ultimately led to Egypt. But, God, but, but Joseph said, it was God's will that I be here. And when Joseph was there, he had a brilliant uh, understanding of Pharaoh's dream. He was able to understand how they needed to preserve the food and the people were provided for during a time of famine. God orchestrated that. Uh, think about King Cyrus, uh, the Medo-Persian king. It was prophesied 125 to 150 years before he was born. He was called by name and God said, he will be my instrument to allow my people to leave Babylon and return to the land. Think about that. God called him by name. Think about the time, the 70 years that they spent in captivity in Babylon. God's a God of exactness. For 490 years, they ignored the Sabbath year. And so the word said that for every year they ignored one seventh of 490 is 70. For those 70 years, because they would not let the the land lie fallow, they would be in bondage and the land would receive its rest from their labor. And you don't think God is sovereign? God is working even today. And we see illustrations. I could share more and more, but we don't have the time. But the fact of the matter is God is over all and it behooves us to get it. I wonder today, don't you want to be on the side of the one who orchestrates everything? In these days that are so tenuous, as Stephen talked about, that, that, are, that are filled with so much darkness, so much doubt, so much unrest, don't you want to be in the hand of the one who controls it all? And so today, I want to go back, and, and we've looked at Gallio, and I want to go back and review these last few months, uh, four things that really jumped out at me this week, four things as we consider the sovereign hand of God. And hopefully like my friend from years ago, it will actually make sense to us. And the first thing I want you to see is this, a Christian who is actively serving God will face adversity. I hate to tell you that, But the truth of the matter is, if you desire to serve God with your heart, you can expect adversity. Now, there are a lot of preachers on the television that will not tell you that. There are a lot of preachers that will say, just follow God and your life is going to go perfectly. You're going to have lots of money. You're going to have wonderful health. All your children's teeth are going to be straight. You're going to have everything you would ever need if you just follow God. The problem is that's false teaching. That's not what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God teaches that if we choose to follow God and if we're actively serving God, we might expect to face adversity. What about Paul? Paul was run out of town. He was beaten. He 
He was out in the open waters alone for days. He suffered uh, even at the hands of the religious. What about Jeremiah? They dug a pit and threw him in it. He was doing the work of God. What about Stephen? If Stephen were to stand here today uh, in, in a resurrected form, and he will be at that time when the Lord comes back, he'll be raised bodily. But if he were to even stand here today, he would say, I lost my life just because I did the work of God. What about Jesus? Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. I don't even have a place to lay my head. And then he was crucified. In Jesus' Sermon on the Plain, which we just studied in Sunday school, one of the Beatitudes was this, Blessed are you when people, not if, when people hate you, exclude you, insult you, and slander you for my name. It doesn't say hate you because you're a jerk or despise you because you did them wrong. But what it's saying is blessed are you when people revile you because of me, because you follow me. And he said, the blessing is this. You're showing that you're keeping good company. The prophets themselves were treated that way. And great is your reward. Paul, during these two journeys, suffered for doing right. And this was not separate from the will of God. In 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, Peter writes, Don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes along to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, share in the sufferings of Christ. It may not be fun, but it may be necessary. My good friend, Bruce Larson, I've shared this before. There was a famous athletic figure that became a Christian. And immediately after this guy became a Christian, he went into a slump in his profession. Nothing could go right. And, and I remember Bruce saying, Rick, that's the best thing in the world that could happen to him because he needs to realize just because you accept Christ doesn't mean everything's going to go perfect for you. Often God works through adversity. And we learn in this, God works through adversity. Do we want it? No, we don't. We don't want to go. Do we go kicking and screaming? Sometimes we do. But God has a purpose in his sovereign will of using adversity in the Christian's life. But I want you to see a second truth that we've seen in this study that goes along with this first one. Individual Christians need the fellowship of other believers. We need it. Because life is difficult, because we are are, are swimming upstream against the culture because there's difficulty we need we need those around us last week and throughout this study we have seen that God surrounded Paul with fellow Christians if Paul needed uh, fellow believers around him who are we to think that we do not Hebrews 10 24 and 25 says do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit or doing but encourage one another even as you see the day approaching even more as you see it approaching God created the church as his primary instrument for fellowship and we need fellowship. It is God's will that a Christian not live an isolated life. If you think about the temptations, uh, Satan could get nowhere with Jesus, but what did he try to do? He isolated him when he tempted him in the garden. All right, think about Adam and Eve. They weren't together. Eve was separated out when, when she was uh, tempted by Satan. Satan loves to isolate. That's why we need the fellowship. And it's God's will that we be together. Why is it God's plan? I want to share briefly three things. Coming together and having brothers and sisters in Christ, it protects us from the sins and temptation that accompany loneliness or aloneness. In other words, there are ways that we can be attacked when we're alone that we are not going to be attacked when we're in fellowship. Secondly, it enables us to accomplish more for the kingdom. When we are together, we can accomplish. Guess what? 
I might be able to knock on three doors this afternoon to share Christ, but if every one of us did that, imagine how many doors we could knock on. Years ago, uh, we had uh, softball teams that were in Pamplin, and I can remember we took the church bus, and Jack was driving, and you may remember it. There was a pine that had dropped across 608. We were on the way back, and Jack and I, we were the real men. We were going to get out and move it. We couldn't do it, so we had to get all the ladies to come out and help us move it. And I still remember it. There's about 10 or 12 of them. They're piling out of the van. And those 10 ladies got done with the two men. Well, we couldn't get done, all right? But there was strength in numbers. We talked about that. There's a benefit to fellowship. We need the strength in the fellowship so we can accomplish more for the kingdom. I can't, but we can. You can't, but we can. And then thirdly, it gives us support in difficulties. We need that support. There's times when we need encouragement. We just need someone there who's a Christian brother or sister to say, I understand, I can listen. But I want you to see a third thing that we've learned in this study. Only God saves a person, but we are called to communicate the gospel. Only God can save a person. You can't save a person. God sovereignly saves. A person who does not know Jesus is spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. And there's no spiritual CPR you and I can perform because we're not the life giver. God is the life giver. We can't convince someone to become a Christian. If I could, I would try to convince you. I can't do it. I can be a messenger, but I can't convince. Salvation is not a means of persuasive talk or bribery or manipulation. It is the communication of the gospel. We're the messengers, but God does the saving. Salvation is a work of God. I love what my favorite preacher, Dr. Adrian Rogers, said. I still listen to him, even though he passed away a number of years ago. He said, anything I personally can talk you into, somebody else can talk you out of. And so it's not a matter of talking someone into becoming a Christian. It's the work of the Holy Spirit breathing life into someone. So let's not be mistaken. And this is a truth. God does the saving work. If somebody says, hey, I went out and I saved someone, you say, oh, that's not right. God saved that person. But in his providence, he has given us the blessed privilege and responsibility of communicating the gospel. Every Christian should seek to become comfortable sharing his or her faith. Every Christian should be seeking segues to be able to communicate. We're going to begin in the spring uh, visiting in our community one night a week, just visiting with people in our community sharing the gospel. Uh, That's one of the blessings of having more daylight. I would love to have you come out. We don't often have a large group, but we're getting in to to this community. God has given us the responsibility. You know, one of the more memorable parts of this study, and it just occurred to me, you remember when Paul was in Philippi and they arrested him and they were going to run him out of town and they realized he was a Roman citizen and Paul could stand on his rights and he could have stood there and fought for days and he probably would have won because they mistreated him as a Roman citizen. But he complied with the people and continued with the gospel. In other words, he didn't get distracted from the gospel work. He made his point. I'm a Roman citizen, you've not done well, but he didn't belabor the point and fight that battle. He moved on and shared the gospel. Listen to what Romans 10 says. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then Paul asks, how can they call upon the one whom they've not believed? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without someone sharing about him? God has chosen to use you and me to be a voice, to communicate the gospel to others. That's his sovereign plan. He works in many ways, but this is his primary plan of communicating the gospel. Then look at the fourth point. There are people who will believe who still have yet to believe. Years ago, I I sort of changed how 
I, I stated things. I said, you're either a believer or a non-believer today. I like to stay positive. You're either a believer or you yet can believe. Do you realize? You're either a believer right now or you still can believe. You're one yet to believe. I pray today, if you've not trusted Jesus Christ, that you would believe. There was a reason Paul moved from town to town. The seed was planted in a town. Sometimes of his own, of the Spirit's leading and his own response to that, he went to the next town. Sometimes God's sovereign hand led opposition to drive him, and he moved to another town where he spread the gospel. But the fact of the matter is, Paul continued the work. Why was that? Because the work was not finished. Paul's work was not finished. Jesus' work was finished. Jesus did everything he could do in order to, for you to be saved. And that was, he died on the cross and he rose again. But Paul still had the work, the unfinished work of sharing the gospel, of telling people of the finished work of Christ. Now think of all the adversity Paul went through, but he kept on keeping on. Why was that? Because there were still ones to believe. We know that God is sovereign, and part of his will is that not any should perish, but all should come to repentance. We also know that God's work's not finished. How do we know that? Because in Matthew 24, 14, it tells us this gospel would be pre preached to all people all nations before his return. The work's unfinished. We have two missionaries now we mentioned that are going to India, reaching areas that have yet to be reached. God is not coming back until people groups have heard. And, and while that opportunity is there, there are people even in our own community who have yet to believe. The beautiful thing about Paul, no matter what happened, remember the divisive thoughts between him and Barnabas over John Mark? The, the adversity of people, religious people running him out of town. He never lost his focus. He kept on sharing. He was sent from Antioch at the beginning of the first journey, and he immediately preached the gospel. And now we see at the end, as he finishes the second journey, heading back towards Syria, we see that he stopped and he preached again in the synagogues. He kept preaching, fulfilling a vow, the Nazarite vow. He had to have his hair cut off. Why, why did he follow that vow? Not that it made him more righteous, but it gave him a platform, what? To share the gospel. That he could say, look, I am a Jew to the Jews. I am following this vow, making that connection with them and engaging in the synagogue. So we see God's will. Would we get it? Would it make sense to us that we are called to faithfully endure hardship in the journey? That we're called to seek the fellowship, that we need to be connected with one another, that we need to seek it out in this place, in small groups, in fellowships, in the homes, that we share him with others, that God's desire is that we be the instrument. He does the sa saving, we do the sharing, and that we keep on doing it until he returns. Let's pray. Fathers, we've looked to your word today. We thank you for the lessons from these first two journeys. And Lord, we pray in this hour that you would convince us of the truths that we have learned in this review, in this study over these few months. And Lord, as we come to this time of response, there may be some here today who need to yield to the sovereign hand of God and say, I need Jesus in my life. There may be others here today who have wandered, who have gotten off track, but Father, by your mercy and your grace and your sovereign will, you're speaking to them this hour, draw them to you. And Lord, may we resolve as a church that we would be your instrument to share the gospel in this community and beyond. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.